events is Trends and Insights. Um, Giving by Foundations Trends and Insights. Before we dive in, I want to tell you a little bit about Alfred Group and go through some housekeeping items. So many of you, most of you are familiar with who we are and what we do. Uh, but for those of you who may not be, Alfred Group is a national full service consultancy. Um, we work specifically with the nonprofit community and have six flagship services seen here on the screen. All things fundraising, strategic and organizational planning, governance and leadership development, interim staffing, data management analytics, and diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, we are a proud sponsor and member of AFP, um, the Association of Fundraising Professionals. We're a certified women's business enterprise and a member of the Giving Institute. Um, I want to um, pause and take a moment to acknowledge the land on which we reside. I realize all of you are coming from many different places across the country, um, but we're going to acknowledge Chicago, Illinois, which is where Alfred Group's headquarters is based. Uh, Chicago is located on the traditional unceded homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, the Jibwa, Ottawa, and Potawatomi Nations, Many other tribes, such as the Miami, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Sac, and Fox, also called to this area home. The region has long been a center for indigenous people to gather, trade, and maintain kinship ties. A few house housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. Um, we will share the recording of the webinar with you via email uh, within 24 hours of today's session. After the webinar concludes, you'll be prompted to complete uh, a survey. It's really short, would love your feedback. Uh, everyone today is in listen only mode for the duration of the webinar. However, the chat is open and we encourage you um, to use the chat um, for reactions, comments throughout the presentation. Uh, in fact, if, if you would like, um, say hello, feel free to put your name in the chat, tell us where you're from, and we'd love to start the dialogue there. Uh, if you have a question at any time throughout today's presentation, please use the Q&A icon instead of the chat. So we will better be able to track the questions as they come in, and we will answer as many questions as possible at the end of today's presentation. Um, want to let you know that our session today is approved for one CFRE credit for anyone seeking certification or recertification for your CFRE credentials. And then finally, um, please join us uh, on social media as well. So you can use our handle at the Alford Group and the hashtag GivingUSA2023, and uh, we will engage in conversation there as well. So without further ado, I will hand things over to our moderator uh, today, who is Sharon Tickness. Sharon is the Chief um, Client Experience Officer with Alford Group, and she will lead us through today's session. Hello, everyone. Happy Thursday. Happy Foundation Learning Day. Uh, we're so excited to have this time with you, this conversation with you. As uh, Lucinda said, I'm Sharon Tickness. I use the pronoun she, her. I'm sitting in my home office wearing a gold top and pearls, have short brown hair, and behind me is a bookshelf and a mirror and a lamp. Um, and I wish we were in a room together so you could see that and uh, be with us all in person and um, in, in eye, eye to eye with each other. Um, as we get started here, I just want to let you know that I'm going to just quickly go through, touch on some key metrics around the Giving USA data that was released this summer, um, specifically with a focus on foundation giving. Alpha Group loves to base our um, our thinking, our thought leadership, our work with clients around data and helping that to inform how we think about the way that we approach our work. And then I know that you are, as I am, so excited to have a conversation with our three panelists and um, I'll introduce them to you in just a few moments. So let's jump in. Um, Giving USA is um, the longest uh, running uh, uh, a report on phil philanthropic giving in the United States. Um, it's developed by the Giving 
USA Foundation, which is part of the Giving Institute. Alpha Group is a proud member, as Lucinda said, of the Giving Institute, a, a group of um, consulting firms like Alpha Group and those in the social sector who help to bring strength and wisdom to the way that we can all be informed in the way that we work and utilize philanthropic dollars to have its greatest impact. Um, we're also so thrilled that Brenda Asari, our president and CEO of Alpha Group, is now serving as the chair of the board of the Giving Institute. Um, we are uh, so grateful to our research partners and the Indiana University Lilly School of Philanthropy, who compiles the research and writes the report along with members of Giving Institute firms. It is a big data project. It's it represents 128 million households, um, one point nearly five million nonprofit organizations, 90,000 foundations, plus businesses of all sizes. So maybe you, I'd, we'd love to hear from you how you use the Giving USA data in your um, organization. Feel free to drop in the chat. You use it with your board. You use it as a benchmark to your giving. Um, how do you use the Giving USA data? We're dying to know. Um, we we hope that it's something that lives and breathes in the way you think about your your approach. And um, the report is available to you with a 30% discount. Um, you can write to info at alford.com and uh, get the link and the code to um, buy the report. It comes in a subscription model. It's great information for you to be able um, to use in your work. So real quickly, three quick takeaways from the Giving USA data. Um, in 2022, giving was down after two years of record generosity. Foundation giving is up and comprises a larger percentage of overall giving. And now more than ever, strategies to stay in relationship with your donors could not be more essential. So just looking at the big takeaway around giving overall, um, the data came out last, uh, again, a couple of months ago um, with a total of $499.33 billion in total giving. That was a decline of 3.4% in current dollar, dollars and a decline of 10.5% in inflation adjusted dollars. I'm going to be using inflation adjusted dollars as the comparison. Uh, the report comes in both, but from our vantage point, uh, inflation adjusted dollars, dollars gives you a better year to year um, and decade by decade comparison. So as we look at total giving over um, the last 40 years, you see here how the, the trend in giving has continued to go up, except for, as you see in the green bars, periods of recession. However, in our um, great uh, ex shared experience around the pandemic, while we had a, reception, a recession in 2020, giving did not go down. It continued to soar. So we, we just want to take that frame of reference about the generosity of giving and, and how giving follows trends relative to economic performance. Um, economic, uh, in 2022, we saw a reduction in personal income, personal household income, um, obviously related to inflation. Uh, the S&P declined by 19.4%. GDP was down by 2%. GDP, I love to talk about GDP, but I'm not going to go into it, but it represents um, the value of all goods and services within a nation's economy, and it was down um, in 2022 as well. And then we know inflation was a big story last year, the highest in 40 years, reaching 8%. Um, I checked this morning, it was 3.67%, so um, we've come down significantly. And at Alpha Group, we're finding that our clients are um, feeling confident about the economy and um, giving at higher levels, while there was some pullback and um, um, wait and see kind of thinking in the last year. But we're here today to talk about giving by foundations um, as it has grown as a share of total giving in recent years. And um, you can see here how um, the makeup of, of giving um, across the, um, the, the categories of giving 
um, is distributed. And so while we see here that individuals are 64% and bequests, which obviously represents giving from individuals is 9%, when we look at foundations as 21%, um, we want to recognize that about half of foundation giving is from individuals, either through individual uh, family foundations or through um, giving to uh, donor advice funds at foundations. So just to remind ourselves of, um, you know, giving by individuals, whether it's directly or through a foundation or a foundation vehicle, such as a community foundation, um, is represents 83.5% of all giving. And I know how um, important it is for us all to be able to share that context as we talk with donors and volunteers and board members relative to the significance of giving. But going deeper, just you know, looking even at mega gifts, we think about these as being, um, you know, we read about mega gifts all the time. A mega gifts is um, um, calculated at a $500 million or more gift. Uh, when we look at these mega gifts in 2022, you see that, that the majority of them are by individuals to their family foundation. Um, Bill Gates giving to the Gates Foundation. Mackenzie Scott is the exception here. She um, has been, you know, fantastically giving in deeper and broader ways uh, to many sectors throughout the country. Warren Buffett um, gave 758 million, but to um, four different foundations. So again, you can see how a lot of the mega gift giving is going into foundations, which is why we're here to talk about how to have the strongest possible relationship with foundations. Um, but just to note that only 5% of total giving comes from mega gifts. So um, some people are, you know, want to keep their eye on that shiny object of, you know, where does, uh, where can we get a, a mega gift, um, but realize that it's everyday gifts, it's the long time donors, it's the long time partnerships with foundations and corporations that will result in major gifts to your organization. I'm just taking a quick look here at giving by source over five year increments. I want to call your attention here to this, this um, green line. You see it goes from six to seven to eight to 11 to now 19% of total giving coming from foundations. So again, this just demonstrates this trend that foundations are now um, representing a larger a, a larger method of giving uh, philanthropic dollars to your organization. Again, um, just providing this for context, uh, you all represent organizations in each of these sectors. Um, you can see here, um, find your sector and see what percentage of giving is coming to you. Um, we, we do want to recognize that um, gifts made to grant making foundations, as well as um, giving to public society benefit, which includes um, foundations such as associations, such as um, uh, organizations that are giving uh, to distributing gifts to organ to uh, the nonprofit sector. So uh, again, giving to foundations shows up even as we look at uh, giving by sector. Again, um, just looking here at this foundation line, the lime green, which here you see a six, oops, sorry, go back, a uh, 6% and then giving to foundations over here, 11%. So again, just to show um, how as a, a portion of total giving to nonprofit organizations by sector has increased in the foundation realm. So, um, Jumping back to our third uh, takeaway as Alpha Group looked at the overall data for this year, that you know, giving is shifting, giving is intentional, the ways that people give is changing, and now more than ever, the tried and true reality that giving is relational, not transactional, is such an important um, perspective for us all to remember in the way that we approach our communication, our engagement of donors. And we just want to 
um, invite you to think about um, your work as really boiling down to how you can engage your partners, your foundation partners um, in the, the most relational and um, authentic ways. Um, just a reminder that foundations are independent uh, foundations, they're public foundations, they're private foundations, they're community foundations. So the spectrum of foundation giving that we're talking about today is everything from a new family foundation to a longtime foundation to the, the foundations that you hear about every day and the consortium of community foundations, which are such an integral part of so many communities across the country. So with that, um, I just want to invite you all to um, jump in and, and respond to a poll. Um, how do you think foundations are prioritizing their giving strategies today? What are you seeing in your relationship and your engagement of foundations? You see here four areas, and we ask you to choose two. Um, this isn't scientific, but just to give us a a, a bit of a pulse of how you all are thinking about your foundation um, engagement, and we're eager to hear um, what what you all think and see here. Um, and uh, while you're doing that, I'm going to take a moment to introduce our panel, um, who, like you, I'm sure, are excited to hear about how they're approaching um, their work in foundation. So first, uh, and Liz, Philip, and Don, I invite you to Come on camera and uh, join the, the conversation here. Liz is the CEO of the Cleveland Avenue Foundation for Education Group. I love the acronym CAFE, which um, is the, the way that they talk about their focused work on with college access, career readiness and attainment. Um, Liz is just a phenomenal volunteer and part, uh, board member and advisor to so many nonprofit organizations. I've had the great privilege of working with her at uh, uh, Chicago Community Trust and the We Rise Together project. Um, she's really passionate about mentoring students and young professionals as they transition into their adult life. Philip Lanham, a wonderful friend, um, is the president and CEO of the Gulf Coast Community Foundation. He guides the foundation's strategy programs, operations, and investment. I was so fortunate to work with Philip at the um, Greater Cincinnati Foundation, where until recently he served as the chief philanthropy officer. And he also um, has served as the past president of ADNET, a consortium of uh, philanthropy professionals throughout the community foundation network. And then Don Cook, who's now a colleague at Alpha Group and uh, delighted to be working with him with clients, but until recently was Senior Vice President for Philanthropy at the Robert R. McCormick Foundation based in Chicago. Um, at, his work was to provide strategy and oversee grant making with a focus on supporting and partnering with organizations and communities addressing democracy, education, violence, justice reform, and supporting veterans. So with that, let's jump in and um, I just invite you all to just say a few words about, you know, your thinking about what we're seeing in our foundation um, trends and how that resonates with you and your work. And Liz, may I invite you to begin? Certainly. Thank you, Sharon. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Liz Thompson. My pronouns are she and her and a new practice that I'm learning describing my background. I am sitting in my office in Chicago and my background includes two windows as well as a lot of uh, important tchotchkes uh, to me. Um, what I will say, first of all, is what a pleasure it is to be here today, Sharon, thank you. Um, I don't take it lightly that I'm speaking to hundreds of people that have chosen a career in philanthropy. Um, you could be doing anything and yet you've chosen uh, to raise money for issues and, and missions that mean so much, not only to you, but to this world. Uh, and I respect you, I see you, and I thank you for making those career choices. So I wanna just honor you first for that. Um, and the next thing I do wanna say is as Sharon mentioned, we all have such different perspectives. 
I'm representing my very small family foundation. I'm a philanthropist that uh, is proud to invest the money that we've been blessed with, the resources. I am a fundraiser that runs a 501c3 that has to fundraise. So I identify with the hundreds of you on the call. Um, but I run a foundation that is beholden to the rules, the laws of the IRS. And so as I see these trends, Sharon, that you highlighted for us today, I'm both encouraged because of how much foundational giving is up historically over, over these last few years, and also you know, concerned about it being down slightly. And I understand from an economic perspective why that is. But I also feel deeply that what we saw in 20 and 21 was as a response to the multiple pandemics that we had. And what I'm hopeful, but honestly not entirely sure, is that that trend won't completely go away, that people won't have just given because the moment called for it, but the moment has been calling for it for centuries. And so mm -hmm. I hope, Sharon, is that people dug in, understood the problems, the issues, and that uh, what they saw has called them to continue giving at the pace that we did before. Mm, thank you, Liz. Mm -hmm. Philip, would you like to say hello next? Oh, can't hear you. <laughs> yeah, three years later and we're still, uh, still struggling. <laughs> Uh, Sharon, thanks for having me, inviting me to be part of this important panel. Uh, my name is Philip Lanham, he, him. I am currently located in Sarasota, Florida at our uh, the Gulf Coast Community Foundation Sarasota Philanthropy Center. Uh, as Sharon mentioned, I've been the CEO here since June 1st, and, um, <clears throat> and I am uh, in front of a dark background with shelving, and I have a white shirt on with a blue jacket. And um, I am... Glad I, I'm really uh, it's rewarding to be here because the the audience are my people. I have been a grant seeker almost my entire career, and <laughs> I, I I get you. I see you as as Liz said, and uh, I think every grant maker should have been a grant seeker at some point in their career to understand um, the the how stressful it is and to have that lived experience to relate to um, other grant seekers as we make decisions. Um, that's I'll get off my soapbox on that front. Um, I want to give a shout out to Kristen from the Florida Center for Early Childhood. I saw you check in uh, in the chat and uh, a, a local uh, Sarasotian. Um, so I want to give a shout out to you. Um, sharing to your question of my overall thoughts about it, it it's exciting to see foundation growing, foundation giving growing over um, uh, that trend from 1983, I think it went back to. Um, excited to see that. Um, it does speak more to where the wealth is in our society that it's uh, the rich are getting richer and the 1% is becoming, you know, the 0.9%. Um, and they are the ones who are establishing the foundations, which is good for the, the rest of society. Um, I also, um, the fundamental issue with private foundations, and I know this is private foundations and community foundations, and the 5% rule, um, it was always meant to be a floor, not a ceiling. And mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the issues we're seeing after 20 and 2020 and 2021 is people are going back to it being a ceiling and they had so much carryover from 2020 and 2021 because they dig deep, they they dug deep between um the um covid pandemic and um, the racial awakening that we had in 2020 people dug deep and went into uh beyond the five percent but then they got that carryover from the irs um and they didn't have to give as much um they weren't required to give as much in 2022 and i'm I fear that might have been um, one of the reasons we're seeing that decline in 22. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Don, I should have noted, speaking of a grant maker and grant seeker, that um, it, before your work with the McCormick Foundation, you were the chief development officer at the Field Museum and Philadelphia Orchestra, and, and certainly come from the grant seeker mode as well. Yep, thanks, thanks Sharon. That's, um... I, I was thinking of sharing that because it, it is, uh, I agree with Philip 100%. It was very important to have raised money for a number of years and gone through that in order to come over and, and have more sensitivity and understanding of the dynamic between the people who can give it away and, and the people who who needed to do their work. Yeah, name's Don Cook, Programs are, are, pronouns are he, him. Um, I'm in front of a, a wall of, of stuff uh, that includes uh, 
the commemorative baseballs that I collected at World Series and All-Star Games over 10 years uh, at the McCormick Foundation, working with Major League Baseball to help veterans coming home with post-traumatic stress. Uh, and we set up clinics across the country and, and had a great program. But one of the benefits was I got to go to some games and, uh, and pick up baseballs, which are you know, now collecting dust. Um, <laughs> I, I, I agree completely with both, both uh, Liz and, and Philip on this issue of, of the decline. Um, I, I think that, that I, I know many of our colleagues in Chicago really reached beyond, uh, beyond the, the ceiling, or as, as Philip put it, and, and probably have, have come back a bit. Um, I also very concerned and, and, and would love to see more detail on this at some point of, of the smaller givers and, and how the situation with the pandemic and, uh, and, and inflation uh, you know, have affected their their giving overall. Um, you know, the rich have gotten richer, and even though there's sometimes there's concern about, uh, you know, the 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 feeling about the the stock market affects them psychologically in terms of their giving. Um, I think really we've been sort of you know hurt in the middle of the giving uh, pyramid, and I, and I, I would love to see some more information on that. As a foundations, I think a lot more in donor advised funds, a lot more people setting up family foundations, so big growth there. Um, and and you know the the stock market, it, despite ups and downs, is higher today than it was before the pandemic. And so when when foundations are working off rolling averages, and and calculating the five percent, it, it's you know there's going to be continued growth in that as long as the markets do well. Um, but I, I think that um, I think so much has to do with psychology in this in this world and um, mm -hmm. and particularly in giving at, at all levels. Right. Um, Philip, I want to go back to you when we were thinking about this, um, like what has changed? How did the pandemic impact giving and what has changed? Um, you had an interesting point about how federal giving um, is is perhaps playing a part then and now. Yeah. Yeah. Um... The what well, I was seeing. So um, just for the uh, for the participants, I'm, I have two perspectives. I have my Cincinnati experience, which uh, goes up until March 31st of this year, and then my Gulf Coast experience um, as of this summer. So I'll go back and forth. And I'll try to be clear which experience I'm leaning into. Um, I was in Cincinnati at the time, and uh, many of our donors who wanted to be generous would say, OK, uh, I want to understand how early childhood needs my support right now. And we'd lean out to our partners, or reach out to our partners to find out. And they couldn't tell us because some of the, a lot of the federal funding was approved in 2020 or 2021. It was still flowing through the system. And uh, I personally believe and many of our donors believe that government could go should go first and philanthropy should follow on and fill gaps. And so we were waiting for how that federal money was going to be spent. And so then the, there wouldn't be that gift from the donor advised fund going to the early childhood um, space because those federal dollars, they, they didn't know how to spend it or they weren't sure how they were going to spend it or they were going to be approved. And there was a lot of unknown. And um, depending on the donor who we're counseling, they are not comfortable with the unknown. So um, mm -hmm. how, uh, trying to have that information with the federal money flowing through the system and it sparked the inflation that we saw um, when there's that much federal money flowing, it just causes a lot of uncertainty. And Liz, I, I invite you to share your perspective about how foundations um, adapted new practices uh, to help expedite giving and understanding requests and where we are today, what's stuck and you know, wh what, where do we have work to do still in helping foundations to be the most efficient and, and helpful as possible? Sharon, one of the... Um trends that I saw personally um, that was very encouraging with people started reaching out. Uh, let's take, for example, the, the racial awakening. People were reaching out saying, what can I do? They were looking for people that were closest to the issues. You know, let's just put it out there. They were calling their black friends saying, hey, tell me, what can I do? Tell me something. Um, and that was encouraging from the perspective that said somehow something clicked that people understood that we need to understand at a deeper level what is happening mm -hmm. in the nation around us. Uh, mm -hmm. That was very encouraging, a little baffling why it took 
this event, but encouraging that that was happening. And the same thing was happening in foundations. They were reaching out to different members of the community. They were reaching out to different aspects of government, local government, local religious leaders to say, what is happening around us? How can we understand and what can we do to help? These are practices that I saw that I hope for the life of me continue. Um, the other practices that we saw was that rules and regulations that foundations once had in place, you got to apply and then it's going to take six weeks, six months, six years before you get something. That all got <laughs> compressed. And now people were getting money pushed out into the field in weeks and it was necessary, it was life-giving to many organizations. Uh, many of those practices, unfortunately, I have seen fall to the wayside and revert back. But I find it uh, impossible to think that some of those practices won't stick for the long term. I think they will. I think people will understand that that proximity that they now have to community leaders, to uh, religious leaders, to people that are doing the work, that proximity, once you have it, it's hard to, to let it go. And so right. I would say those two things, Sharon, the proximity that they gained and the nimbleness in their giving, uh, I hope to see continue. Mm. Here, here. Um, Philip, as we were uh, talking together about this, uh, sort of carrying on that topic, you, you brought forward that one of the elements that foundations really adapted in a new way, uh, you you called trust-based philanthropy. I'd love for you to talk a bit about that. Sure. Yeah, it is not my phrase. It is a practice that uh, many funders follow and many donors follow. And it's uh, trusting, getting to, and it, it's fundamentally based on getting to know an organization so well that you don't need a 20-page application to know how they're going to spend the resources. And it's built on trust that they're going to be candid with you. It's trust both ways, but the nonprofit will be candid and share the the, the good, the bad, and the ugly um, with the with the foundation. The foundation will lean in and not penalize them for that or uh, approach it with a punitive mindset. But how can we help you get through that challenge? Um, if you don't hit all your measures that you said you're going to hit, um, and, and that's also the important part, they set their metrics, not the funder. Um, and that's, uh, that, I think that'll be the biggest challenge uh, in the funding community is for us not to force our own metrics on another organization. Um, during the pandemic, we didn't have time for applications, applications. We had to get money out. Um, and in uh, I'm learning how to be a resident of Florida in a hurricane prone territory. And uh, I was not here for Hurricane Ian last fall, um, which will be a, a one year and a couple of days. Um, but our foundation, um, Gulf Coast Community Foundation, was making grants within 24 hours to the nonprofits who were serving the people affected by it the most. And those nonprofits were affected, right? It's not like the nonprofits weren't protected. So um, we were trying to support them as quickly as possible and get money out. And our donors responded. Um, so it's that quickness and particularly community foundations are well positioned to have that urgent um, we're flexible, we're nimble, we can we, um, we can really get resources out to where it's needed most in those crises. Um, and it's uh, it's un it's unfortunate we have those crises, but um, I'm glad community foundations can help address them. Absolutely. And Alpha Group is so honored to work with dozens of community foundations across the country. And certainly community foundations have been um, the, the just so essential in moments of crisis in a community, whether that be due to violence or wildfire or um, a hurricane, or as, as we learned all foundations, community foundations and foundations learned um, in a pandemic, how foundations and particularly community foundations can be that centrifuge to gather and, and help um, in such an urgent way. Um, I, I, I think I'm going to move on to giving strategies, but Don, if there's anything you want to jump in and say quickly, then I'll um, give you a moment. I, I just wanted to add that the general operating support got to be very important during the pandemic. And that's another area that I, I would hope would continue to, to, to go along with Liz and, and Philip's points. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, I've also... Uh, can't understand why foundations can't come up with a common application 
given that the universities can. I mean, I think right. we would save, you know, endless amounts of time not having people have to reinvent the wheel and fill in our forms our way. And and there's been some efforts on that. And and during the pandemic, you know, I, we, we made it very simple for people to apply. You know, somebody we'd given money to for 10 years, we really didn't have to have them have a paragraph of what they do, you know. Mm -hmm. And so this is this is back to the trust and, and the confidence and people giving to people. So, um, right. but I think that general operating support was really important, getting it out the door quickly. And, mm -hmm. um, and I would wish that would continue Again, trusting that the people know what they're doing and getting their job done. Here, here. Well, I want to um, ask Lucinda to pull up the poll results. Um, we're going to move to um, how our panelists are thinking about identifying giving strategies and want to see what you all are um, experiencing in your relationships with uh, foundations. So it looks like uh, projects with a clear approach and special a specified impact um, has the highest response rate at 65% followed by projects that advance equality and social justice. Um, but they all have a strong response of 25% or more. Um, so we, we are going to talk a bit now about um, how uh, foundations um, think about, identify their giving strategies, and also move into how um, we all as partners with foundations can demonstrate our impact and, and get some insight on that as well. But um, Don, let's start with you. Are, are, are foundations moving toward or away from general operating impact? You uh, uh, operating funding, um, you, you just brought this up, but I'm just curious to hear each of you share your perspective on this. Well, as I said, I wish they, would, they were moving more toward it. Um, right. You know, the, the general operating support grants tend to be smaller. Um, projects that are th multi-year projects, capital, so on, they're, they're, they're the larger grants. So there's a, a bit of a trade-off there. Um, but uh, I, I just would continue to hope that there's room for that. Uh, McCormick did a lot of general operating support grants when I was there, but we also did, you know, uh, specific things for early childhood programs and our veterans work and so on. So it was kind of a combination of both. But uh, as a funder, as a fundraiser, uh, my first 25 years, um, general operating support always came first. We, we, you know, had to, we had a lot of costs that we understood and needed to do and, and uh, weren't always fundable or easily fundable uh, through project grants. So I would love mm -hmm. that to continue uh, and, and be expanded after the pandemic. I think it was a lesson learned. Mm -hmm. Liz, do you have anything to add there? I do. Um, I think it goes towards what Don and Philip said earlier, having philanthropists or people that have careers in philanthropy be fundraisers. Uh, because I remember when I was raising money for the organizations I ran and now raising money to do the philanthropic work we do, all of our giving is general operating support. And while we, uh, you know, are on the smaller side, we give away, you know, six and a half million dollars a year. Um, but nonetheless, every bit of that is general operating support because we fundamentally understand, A, it's most necessary, and B, it's what our um, executive director struggles so hard to find. So mm -hmm. for me, and I think for others that are new or doing their own philanthropy, we understand this is essential for our organizations. Mm -hmm. um, well, so you do gen ops, which is amazing. Um, yeah. And however, many foundations do have, you know, very specif specific giving areas and strategies. So um, Philip, what is your thinking about how nonprofits can align, uh, position um, their work with foundations? <laughs> and this is the uh, the most unsatisfying response ever. And I was like, it depends. Uh, unfortunately, on on the funder, um, everyone uh, approaches this very differently. And uh, for example, Gulf Coast. Uh, just this week, we hosted a breakfast on Monday morning. Um, with all of uh, the organizations we have supported over the last year or two and provided the what I believe is one of the most transparent grant making um, uh, presentations to the, the folks who receive funding from us. We told we told them how much we have in our discretionary discretionary budget every year, how much is going to each of the initiatives. Um, so they knew where the resources were that our three initiatives focused on affordable housing, 
uh, mental health and the environment with a focus on water quality, like that is where the bulk of our resources are. So if you don't play in that space, this is how much is left for the other areas that we do care about, but they're just not our key priorities. Um, and because um, we believe these three are the ones that are affecting um, Sarasota County the, the, the most right now. Um, and so I think believe, I believe in transparent and authentic relationships. And um, when you have those, you can be candid with your uh, nonprofit partners. Um, and I said it on Monday, and I'll say it again to this group, like the secret that most funders won't tell you is we need you. We have to give our money away and it's to the nonprofit community. And we need you to deliver on that. The distribution model for the community change we seek is through the nonprofit sector. Um, and so the more authentic and candid we can be with our partners so that they can be their um, best, bring the best programs and best missions that align with our priorities, the better our work will be and the better um, the community will be overall. Hmm. Aaron, can I hop in? Because sometimes we Please. don't, um, you know, I think pay enough attention to the fact that many foundations are operating off of the instructions of people that set them up who have been long gone. And so very often, you know, the people that are working within those organizations have tied hands in many cases mm -hmm. around what they can give to and what they can't. So I, I, I do want to make sure we give the nod and everybody knows this, but I just think it bears repeating. Sometimes your hands are tied by what you can give based on who set that foundation up and what they were interested in giving to. Um, mm -hmm. and so we recognize that and, and, you know, we know that people have to live within those guidelines, but where those guidelines don't exist, uh, I think general operating support is, is more on the front lines now. Uh, can I just add though, uh, I, 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 I think um, th there is a reason to have guidelines. And, and I think we need to recognize that as well. N nobody has enough money to do everything. Or, and so where can you focus? And I always looked at this and, and I know how frustrating it was when I was a fundraiser because we didn't fit in certain places and, or we didn't fit in a lot of places if you're the Philadelphia Orchestra. And, uh, and so, you know, but, but, I, but I recognize that the importance of focus, if you want to have impact with your investments. Uh, and so, so as Philip said, this, these are partnerships. We, we, we need the partner doing the work to accomplish, you know, what we want to get done and what we want to get done together. Um, but, but that's the reason that we have guidelines is because we need to focus and not just scatter things wildly. So within that focus, in the case at McCormick, we were in early childhood education for 30 years, or 20 years before I got there. Um, but that was a focus area, but that didn't mean we can't do general operating grants within that focus area so right. Right. Um, yeah. and 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 should as well, along with project grants but i just wanted to underscore that's why the guidelines exist to have to, to increase the the likelihood of achieving impact for some goals we we were lucky at mccormick uh, we had very broad guidelines from our founder um they were to help the people of illinois and um and and uh education um uh, poor, you know, people uh, in poverty and so on. So we we were very lucky that we had a lot of a lot of leeway in that. So uh, and that's what we tried to do. I spent the last several years working on economic opportunity on the south and west side. So uh, we were allowed to 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 move, maneuver within those guidelines pretty well. Uh, not everybody can. I'd love us to uh, spend the next few minutes thinking about how our our. Um, participants here today can share the impact that they're making and what foundations are looking for that demonstrates um, not just the outcomes and outputs, but um, what what do you want, how can, an or, how can a nonprofit organization best position itself to demonstrate to you that the work that they're doing is having, achieving the long-term impact and solutions that, that you're hoping philanthropic investments will achieve? Um, Liz, let me invite you to start. Yeah, thanks, Sharon. One of the processes that we use with our grantees, and I, and I let me just take a second because I want to explain, we have something called the 1954 project where we identify uh, 10 to 12 leaders a year, five of which each receive a million dollars and the others each receive $50,000. 
we look very closely and do a lot of deep diligence on the over 400 applications we get each year for those awards. And what we look at is what is it that you say you are doing in three areas that we look at economic mobility, innovation and in teaching and learning and diversity in the teaching pipeline. What, do you, what have you said you wanted to do and how have you performed against what you said you were going to do? So for us and what another trend that I see, and I think Philip mentioned this, what is it that you say you want to measure? What are you doing and how are you measuring what you are doing and what progress have you seen? Those are our measures. We sit down once a year with each of our grantees and we say, how are you doing compared to what you said you were going to do? And how can we help be helpful to you along those lines? And so there is no one set of metrics that we're looking at. If we have five leaders, we're looking at five sets of metrics in order to measure impact. It may not have the kind of broad-based scaling impact, but it has impact to that organization based on what they said they were going to do. And that kind of bespoke measurement and evaluation is how we is the approach that we take. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Philip. Um, can you repeat the question? I was so into Liz's response, I was picked up on everything, and I and I was like, the program that she funds. <laughs> I can't make it. Well, I, what, um, what are the best practices you see, and how organizations can uh, report the impact uh, of mm -hmm. their work? The um, I also believe it's on the funder to do some of the uh, data analysis on mm -hmm. what the impact. So if you have core focus areas like Gulf Coast Community Foundation does, um, we do a regional scan every two years to assess how the ecosystem is changing in those three that I mentioned. And um, we can see if it's directionally moving the way we want to move it. Um, and it's, it doesn't necessarily hold the organization accountable, but we can tell that the strategies we chose um, to invest in are making the impact we want to see. Because as, as a community foundation, we want to give that uh, bird's eye view of what's happening in the community. Um, and we believe that's on our shoulders to assess. I think that's so powerful. I, I love that. And, and it, it just goes to show the distinctive nature of how community foundations can be a, a guiding force, a, a convener around um, community-focused solutions. So um, thank you for sharing that. Um, Don, I'd love to, you to share a, an example of a, an organization that you worked with at the McCormick Foundation in um, developing impact measures and, and a baseline. Well, this was a, this gets right to your, your point, your question, Sharon. The uh, the uh, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. The the uh, the impact is a, is a really complex, difficult thing, and you can make progress, and then there's a recession, and you can make progress, and then there's a, a pandemic, and and so there's so many outside factors, uh, outputs, outcomes, a lot easier to measure. So so we did a really interesting project uh, with Heartland Alliance uh, with their research center here in Chicago, where we worked with them to create a, a database of 50 or 60 individual metrics on health, uh, education, economics, uh, population, age, et cetera, for every, uh, all 77 communities in Chicago. And uh, you can, uh, and, and this was to gather data over a long haul so that we could see 10 years from now what the trends have been in, in you know, education attainment, uh, household wealth, you know, all these things. You could compare and contrast communities. You can look at the average of Chicago overall and compare. And, um, and, and we work closely with, uh, with communities on, on, this, uh, on using this data and looking at trends that, that tied into their quality of life plans that the communities had established. The city uh, started using it because it was easier to use the data all in one place than from all the different dispersed places that they had data coming in. And uh, I think we're probably, uh, now I've been away a year, but I think probably six or seven years into that. So we are accumulating the data uh, and you can graph it and track it and so on. But but to Philip's point, we, we took this on because the question is, how do you know over the long haul 
that you're that things are going the direction you want them to go. Uh, mm -hmm. And it, it's extremely difficult. And some communities do better than others in, in, in different metrics. But um, but it was it's a way to, to think about all the investments being made, not just by us, but by the city, mm -hmm. by the state, federal government, right. other philanthropy. Um, and so we, we found this to be a pretty useful tool in, in working with communities using it. It's just fascinating. I, just, I think that's the most um, enlightening uh, data to in, inform um, where where and how impact can be made. Um, we're going to go to Lucinda in just a moment to bring forward a handful of questions from you all. But before we do that, Liz, could I just ask you to share your thinking around um, the, the Supreme Court's reversal of affirmative mm -hmm. action in June of this year and how you feel foundations might um, help to address um, the reality of, of that decision. Yeah, and Sharon, I think we're gonna see as many reactions to that as there are um, individuals in the world, right? Because some people are gonna head for the heels because they didn't wanna do it in the first place. And some people are gonna double down because they understand that's what's required. So I think foundations can be helpful by signaling to organizations that we are here for you. While this court decision is what it is, um, we know that organizations are doing the necessary work of this nation. And so uh, to double down on, on their support and not head for the hills and not try and nuance it and not try and come up with different language that won't be scrutinized by those, but to call it what it is and mm -hmm. continue giving that level of support. That's what we're doing. We we started off doing, um, you know, supporting black leaders in education. We're gonna continue supporting black leaders in education. And we want to be that organization that maybe people that may not have the same level of risk tolerance, you know, come to us. Cause we'll say the thing and you don't have to. So there will be many, many different approaches to it, uh, but I'm hopeful that foundations and people like are on this panel um, will double down on their support of the organizations that are doing the necessary work. Right, thank you, Liz. Yeah. Okay, Lucinda, help us uh, cover as much territory as we can here. I will, um, a lot of really great questions. Thank you to everyone who is I'm dialoguing in the chat. That's been a really good conversation. And there are a lot of questions that have come in. So we will try to get to as many as we can in the time that we have left. Um, so I'm just going to jump right in. So one question, um, this participant notes, really appreciate Philip's reference to the 5% payout as a floor. What are your thoughts on foundations like Ford who took radical steps to significantly increase their payout? Might this continue as a trend going forward? What are your thoughts? Uh, I don't know if there'll be a trend. Um, I think um, when we have funders who um, take the lead and are blazing trails never done before, it sets an example, whether it's Ford, whether it's Mackenzie Scott making mega contributions unrestricted to um, nonprofits, um, the trend that the, the Gates Foundation is creating that it will sunset 20 years after the last of the three of them pass away. Like those are trends that uh, I, I see the Gates Foundation trend uh, in my individual donor conversations. They don't believe in endowment. They want it gone 20 years after they pass or 10 years. So we need those trailblazers in, in the world to lead um, and set an example for the rest. I, I, it would be great to see more uh, philanthropic resources, especially if the trends are showing a bigger uh, return. Um, that some of those foundations are seeing uh, financial re uh, investment returns. It'd be awesome to see uh, more than 5% granted out. Thanks. Lucinda, I know you, I, I, everybody could comment, but I, I want to cover as many sure. questions as possible. So please go ahead. Sure. Um, next question. So are there, speaking of trends, are there notable trends in the size versus quantity of foundation gifts? Um, any shift in more smaller gifts or fewer larger gifts? Is it a case-by-case -case basis based on each foundation? Um, any trends to share? What have you been seeing? Uh, Liz, please go ahead. Yeah, I, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm seeing both. I think the McKinsey phenomenon is encouraging people to 
try and understand what they can do with significant dollars invested. And so I think people with that level of resource are coming in and doing that. But one of the comments I was going to make earlier uh, when we first started off was we saw an increase in giving to the work that we're doing from people that could give five or ten dollars. And so I think it you know, those numbers may not be reflected in the survey results that you showed, but I think people have this overwhelming sense of what can I do? And when they realize that that five or $10 can make a difference, they will write those checks. So I, I think the trends are going in multiple directions. I am most encouraged, honestly, by people that are writing the five and $10 checks because they see themselves as part of the solution, no matter how small a part of that solution that they are. Here, here. Lucinda, go ahead. Yeah. Um, this is in the evaluation bucket. So if evaluation of a, a project or um, a grant deliverable shows uh, in the data that it's not where the organization was hoping to be, and so they're reporting back to the foundation, um, is your instinct or policy um, to see how you can help that organization get back on track, or do you move on? Um, how do you handle those situations? Don, if if you could take just thirty seconds or a minute to respond, uh, sure. I mean, we're coming to time here. Sure. Well, I, I think this is this is gets to the trust issue again of being able to have legitimate conversations and and authentic uh, understanding of what works and doesn't work, and that foundations shouldn't be penalizing people if a, a project didn't work. And uh, I, at the same time, I think that we don't have to prove everything works because we know things work. And if somebody else does it with fidelity, it should work also. And we don't have to spend lots of time and money uh, trying to track down whether every project is working exactly. But I, I, I do think it's trust. I think we should have the conversations, try to iterate, move on, uh, not from, from the relationship, but move on to a better way to get the work done. Um, and uh, I, I, again, I think that's that's the relationship business that, that we're really in when we, when we deal with people. Thank you. Well, we, we are um, at time to wrap and turn it back to Lucinda. I just can't thank you enough, Liz, Philip, and Don, for um, your joining in the conversation today from the unique and important perspective that you've brought to us all and for the work that you do every day uh, to, to forge uh, solutions in communities across the country. And uh, Alpha Group is so grateful for our partnership with, with you and the work that you do. Lucinda, please uh, take it away. Sure, I'm happy to wrap us up. I echo everything Sharon just said. Thank you, thank you. And again, thank you to everyone who's participating. Um, the dialogue and the conversation has been um, robust and wonderful. Um, want to remind you that we can, uh, we're can. we excited to offer a 30% discount to any anyone who wants to purchase the full report. Uh, send us an email at info at alford.com and we can send you a link to where you can uh, purchase the full report. Uh, a few other reminders, the session today was recorded and we will be sharing that with you via email within the next 24 hours. So keep an eye on your inbox for an email from us. Um, as soon as we conclude here, uh, you will be prompted to complete a really short survey. It's just a few questions. So we consider, uh, we hope that you consider taking our survey and giving us some feedback. Um, and if you didn't, uh, if we didn't answer your question and you have more questions, we surely want to continue the conversation. So send us an email again, it's info at alford.com. We're happy to continue this conversation, um, even as time is closing here. Uh, and then finally, we have uh, more webinars in the works. So um, again, keep an eye on your inbox and on our social media um, channels. And we will send all that information out in terms of our upcoming webinars as well. So again, thank you to the panelists. Thank you, Sharon, for moderating. Thank you to everyone for participating. Um, we're now going to conclude today's session and disconnect. And I hope everyone has a really wonderful day.